Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 6th of October and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 9th of October with me Michael Hewson. Um, it's been a tough week for markets, um, concerns over rising yields have kept investors predominantly on the back foot this week and I think the big question at the moment is whether or not this continued um, sharp rise in long-term yields is likely to continue. Well that certainly seems to be the the big question that has been basically dominating market sentiment this week. Obviously US economic data has probably been more good than bad and ultimately I think it's a good idea if we look at why markets have been freaking out so far this week. So let's start with the US 10-year yield. Now the US 10-year yield has been predominantly moving higher for quite some time now. Um, you can probably pre predate the rises from um, the changing guidance um, on the Fed minutes all the way back um, at the end of September, around about the 21st of September, um, when the Fed altered its guidance round about here for the number of rate cuts it was pricing in for 2024. And it revised its Fed funds rate expectations up from 4.6% to 5.1%. Um, which obviously prompted a big move higher in the longer end of the yield curve. If we look at, say, for example, the the 10 year here, we've gone pretty much from 4.5% to 4.75% on the 10 year and to the highest level since 2007. Compare that to what's happened with the two year. And while we have made marginal new highs, the move up hasn't been anywhere near as extreme relative to the previous peaks of earlier this year. So if you then basically extrapolate that out into the inversion, the current inversion in the yield curve, which we've seen pretty much for all of this year, um, at some point that yield curve will need to uninvert. And I think it's basically how it uninverts which has really been driving sentiment so far these past few weeks because obviously we've got we've seen much higher oil prices oil prices have gone significantly higher since the lows in june um gone from around about 70 dollars a barrel to 95 dollars a barrel and that obviously has also um started to get priced in to the way yields have started to move over the course of the past few days on the basis of the fact that I think people are thinking that inflation is likely to remain not only higher for longer, but also become an awful lot more entrenched, even though the evidence that we've seen thus far is that the rise in oil prices that we've seen over the course of the past three months has been fairly limited. Certainly, I think at the front end, in terms of when I say the front end, at the coalface, as, as, as regards to consumers, obviously they feel it the first in terms of filling up the petrol tank and obviously that erodes um, disposable income over the course of the past three months and probably will continue to do so as we head into. But the hope is that might wash out. We've seen a big, big fall in oil prices so far this week and I think perhaps the fact that we've seen that big fall in oil prices maybe accounts for the fact that we've seen this sharp fall in the 10-year yield from levels just below 4.9% to current levels 4.74% right now. So um, I think the, the main question, I think the main question is how does this here uninvert? Because it will uninvert. Uh, and for a stock market friendly scenario, um, for this to uninvert, what we would ideally like to see is a fall in the two year yield and not a sharp rise in five and ten year, uh, in, in longer term yields. So essentially what markets are concerned about is this, if we start to move towards 5%, go to 5.25% and two year yields also continue to go higher, there is a concern that that can increase financial stress in the financial system. Um, and, and in so doing, obviously uninvert the yield curve, but not in a way that is likely to particularly be market friendly. To be market friendly, we'd want to see a sharp fall 
in the two-year yield back towards the 10-year yield, but without the 10-year yield going up significantly above where two-year yields currently are at the moment. So a softening in two-year and resilience in five and 30 years is an ideal scenario if they remain around about 5% and the two-year drops to around about 475, 480. That would probably be a fairly benign scenario for stock markets. Anything other than that, and you're going to find that the markets are going to be very sensitive to that. So we've got non-farm payrolls later today. The jobs data thus far has shown little sign of a significant slowdown. And obviously that's uh, raising expectations. The Fed's going to go by another 25 basis points um, on the 1st of November. And that's predominantly, I think, why we've seen the dollar move higher this week and we've seen yields move higher this week. It's basically higher for longer, um, and that obviously is that's obviously helping in the context of uh, the U.S. economy being probably the better of all the economies out there right now. So let's look at some of the key support levels um, on the markets this week after the, the declines that we've seen in the first part of the week. Once again, FTSE 100, pretty much nothing to see here. Still fairly decent support at around the 7,200 area. Obviously, we have a little bit of interim support around 73.75, so keeping an eye on that. In terms of valuations, I'm certainly um, much less concerned about a big slide in the FTSE 100, even accounting for the big fall in the oil prices that we saw earlier this week. Let's have a quickly look at Brent, because I think what we've seen so far this week is encouraging, I think, um, not in terms of obviously um, the outlook for uh, demand, but in terms of affordability when it comes to consumer incomes, I think consumer spending. I think if if this trend lower continues, we could see oil head back towards $80 a barrel, which is probably eminently more bearable than say 95 or 100, though OPEC plus is probably gonna have a great deal to say about that given the fact that they've extended their production cuts and confirmed their production cuts until the end of this year. But there are concerns about demand destruction, and I think part of that is behind the reason that we've seen this sharp fall over the course of the past few days, with oil posting its biggest one-day fall um, this year and um, since September last year. So have a, have a, keep, keep a close eye on the 50% retracement of this um, up move, which is around about $84 a barrel and below that at $81.50. But the hope is that potentially we've seen a short-term peak in oil prices and consequently we could well see um, us start to range trade between $80 and $90 a barrel over the course of the rest of the year. Um, in terms of the DAX, nothing much has changed here. Last week I talked about the fact that we broke below the 200-day moving average and we broke below 15000 480 that has continued to act as resistance we've traded below it towards 14,800 obviously we haven't come back to the lows that we saw back in March but there is a risk that we could continue to do so particularly if rate expectations continue to remain at their currently elevated levels what's also a little bit concerning is that we are starting to see a rollover average for the 200 day i'm not overly concerned at the moment of a crossover here we're going to get a crossover here but the 200 day moving average is still pointing upwards and ultimately when we see a death cross on the 50 and the 200 ideally what we want to be seeing is the 200 day either flat or starting to slope lower at around about the same time as the 50 day um, this is not a strong signal of negativity um, what would but but that's that's not to say that we're not in a downtrend now we are we've got major resistance of 15,480 15,500 and we need to break above that to break the current negative cycle on the DAX the S&P 500 is at a big level as well um uh, this not, this week has touched a key level the 200 day moving average i'm keeping a very close eye on that the 4,200 area, or if we break below 4,200, there's a fairly decent chance we could see a sharp move lower down to around about 41.50. Um, and certainly I think 
the, the levels that we saw at the end of May of around about 4,100. So we're on the cusp of a potential breakdown here. Again, 4,300 is the resistance level on the upside that we need to overcome to break the cycle of negativity when it comes to the S&P 500. And a lot could depend on today's non-farm payrolls report. A good report could actually be negative for stocks, positive for yields. So ultimately, I think what we're hoping for is a fairly softish report for non-farm payrolls in line with the softish report that we got from ADP. Um, okay, looking at quickly, have a look at the NASDAQ. Um, similar sort of story, very decent support in and around 14,340. Is this a potential irregular head and shoulders reversal, triple top, whatever you want to call it? Is there, there is a decent chance that if this support level breaks, we could see a test of the 200 day moving average. It's interesting to note how well the NASDAQ 100 has managed to hold up um, given the rise that we've seen in yields. Um, but a large part, I think, of the resilience around the NASDAQ 100 is largely around uh, the resilience of the Magnificent Seven, those Magnificent Seven stocks of Amazon, Facebook, Meta Platforms, as is um, Alphabet, Apple, Tesla, um, NVIDIA. They, they still um, remain fairly resilient. Um, certainly earlier this week, 60% of the NASDAQ were actually down on the day, um, but the NASDAQ actually managed to finish in positive territory. So that sort of tells you something um, in terms of um, how the NASDAQ is being supported. And obviously 40% of the NASDAQ is made up of those magnificent seven stocks. So that's certainly worth keeping an eye out for, particularly if we get a break to the downside. Um, so we've got obviously payrolls today. Next week um, is also a big week um, for markets because we have the US CPI report for September. And we have started to see a tick up in headline inflation um, in the US. We hit lows in June of 3%. We're currently at 3.7%. But don't get too hung up on the headline number. A large part of the reason the headline number has been higher since June has been as a consequence of the rally that we've seen in crude oil prices and gasoline prices at the pump. Core prices are still trending lower. And I think that's really where you now need to start to focus your attention if you haven't already been doing that. Core inflation is still um, trending lower. And in August, that fell to 4.3%. And that is expected to slow to 4.1% in the September numbers. We've also got US PPI next week. Um, so pay particular attention to that, given the fact that that has also started to show a little bit of a pickup um, in the past few months on the headline rate, but on the core rate still remains trending lower. We've also got Fed minutes. Um, Fed minutes likely to be fairly interesting in the overall scheme of things. Just as a quick reminder as to what the Fed decided at its last meeting, um, they raised their 200, 2000, sorry, they raised their 2024 rate guidance, but a Fed funds rate to 5.1 from 4.6%. So we talked about that earlier. It also revised its guidance for 2023 GDP higher to 2.1% as well as revising its unemployment guidance lower to 3.8% for year end. So um, against that much more resilient economy, um, that is essentially why we've seen the move higher in yields. And really now it's becoming ever more incumbent on what the data does as to whether or not we can expect to see a Fed rate hike in November. Next week's CPI reports, today's payrolls report are going to be very, very key in that regard. And at the moment, markets are pricing in around about a 25, 30% possibility of a rate hike in November. So the data over the course of the next few days is likely to be critical as to whether or not that number goes higher or lower. We've also got China. China's back in the markets this week. Um, they've been off for Golden Week holiday which means that we haven't really had any sort of steer uh, 
when it comes to the resilience of Chinese equity markets. Yes, we've had the Hang Seng. The Hang Seng has been under pressure this week and is probably likely to remain so. And we've got China trade and China CPI this week for September. And certainly in terms of China CPI inflation, that has been very weak in, over the course of the past 12 months. Slipped into deflation um, in July, although we have seen a modest uptick in headline CPI then since then to 0.1%. PPI, on the other hand, has been in negative territory since October last year. Um, so we'll see whether or not that trend um, starts to change in the September numbers. Exports and imports are likely to remain in negative territory. And I think the ability for Chinese authorities to stimulate further is being, I think, fairly is being limited by the fact that their property sector, they still need to deal with the problems inherent in that. Let's have a quick look at the currencies. Um, Euro dollar still very much in a downtrend. We can see that here. Found a little bit of a base in and around 104.50. There's big, big support at 104.06. What I've done is I've taken the lows back in September 2022 from the highs earlier this year and calculated some FIB levels for you. So the 50% at 104.05 is likely to be a very, very big number, as is obviously this downtrend line from those peaks back in July and this peak from last Friday, Friday the 29th of September at 106.11, 106.20. So we need to break above 106.20 on euro dollar to break the downward cycle, but we also need to break this downtrend line here to signal that perhaps we are probably going to see a turnaround in sentiment. At the moment, the sentiment for the dollar still remains predominantly positive going forward. Um, let's quickly talk about dollar yen because dollar yen saw a really big plunge lower earlier this week on purported intervention from the Bank of Japan. Thus far, we've seen no evidence that the Bank of Japan did intervene. Certainly, I think in terms of the data published by the BOJ, there's no evidence that they actually sold dollars. But sometimes intervention is less about the actual physical act and more about just picking up the phone and checking levels. And I think that's probably what happened when we moved above 150 this week. Someone at the Ministry of Finance, somebody at the Bank of Japan picked up the phone to various banks to check levels on dollar yen. Well, it was certainly effective because we saw a big spike down to 147.35, um, coinciding with those series of lows in and around there. That's the next key support for dollar yen. If we break below that level there, then we could well signal that a top is in. But the fact that we rebounded so strongly would appear to suggest that at the moment, the bias remains for buying dollar yen on dips, irrespective of what the Bank of Japan might be looking to say or do. Um, until they actually come in and clump the market, it's going to be, it's going to make for a very um, difficult um, uh, calculation to make as to whether or not we've seen a top in dollar yen. Uh, we've also got um, UK GDP for August next week. Again, we've seen a fairly decent rebound on cable from these series of lows around about 120, 120, 35. 120 is always going to be a little bit of a support level, um, round number and what have you, um, and has acted as a fairly decent pivot in the past. So, you know, I think as long as we're, we can hold above 120, we can certainly get a squeeze back to 123. And that's what we really do need to overcome. 123 to signal that a short-term base is in. If we can get back above that, then we can certainly retest the 200-day moving average. But again, the trend here for sterling is probably less positive than it was, say, for example, a few weeks ago. As I say, the UK economy is in much better shape than perhaps an awful lot of people thought it was in light of the recent updates from the Office of National Statistics to their GDP methodology we've discovered that actually the UK economy has outperformed both Germany and France since 2020, which has obviously undermined the political narrative that the UK economy had been a basket case since Brexit. I mean, you know, you, you know I'm one of the first to criticise the uh, the current numpties in charge of um, 
uh, fiscal fiscal policy, the politicians and what have you. But the challenges facing the UK aren't that much different to those being faced in Europe, incoherent energy policy, the Germany shutting down its nuclear power stations. I mean, what's all that about? And reopening coal power stations. Yeah, you know, really joined up thinking there. Um, but we haven't got off to a good start in Q3. And when it comes to monthly GDP, we saw a contraction of 0.5% um, in July. Um, the hope, which, which reversed the 0.5% gain we saw um, in June. So I think what we've got to see here for August is hopefully we'll see a modest rebound of, say, for example, 0.2%. Um, um, at the same time, as obviously we saw a sharper than expected slowdown in headline CPI. So maybe that offered a little bit of a modest boost to consumption patterns during the summer holidays. In terms of earnings, it's going to we're kicking off US earnings season. We've got the banks, the US banks, which are all out on Friday. Um, there have been concerns, obviously, about the US banking system, particularly the regional banking system since the blow up in March. Those haven't gone away. There are still concerns about that, um, JP Morgan notwithstanding, which, you know, and JP Morgan has continued to set itself apart from its US peers. But even here, we're at a fairly key support level on the JP Morgan uh, Chase share price, holding above the 200 day moving average for the time being. Expected to announce Q3 numbers, it's, you know, it's Q2 numbers were a record, um, record revenues of 42, just over $42 billion, blowing through expectations of $39.3 billion, and profits of $4.75 a share or $14.5 billion. That was a 67% increase from a year ago. Um, the bank at the time also raised its guidance for net interest income uh, for the year to $87 billion as the gap between loans and deposits margins blew out even further. Put simply, JP Morgan has more deposits than it knows what to do with. And so far, it, it remains the biggest winner but you can, from, the, from the, the March regional banking crisis, compare that, however, to Citigroup, and it's a completely different story. Citigroup is undergoing a major restructuring process. Um, we're just above this series of lows back in October 2022 and could be on the cusp of breaking lower. Um, CEO Jane Fraser is in the middle of yet another restructuring program, um, job losses. Um, let's not forget she's been in charge since 2021. Um, the bank has already shed 5,000 positions year to date and probably is going to be shedding a hell of a lot more. Um, she's stripping away layers of senior management. Last year, Citigroup said they would focus on five key business areas, including wealth management, investment banking. Five senior managers will be overseeing these two areas, along with trading services and retail, all of which would report to her. Um, Q2 revenues weren't great. They slowed to $19.4 billion. That's $19.4 billion and profits of $1.33 a share. Decline in revenues was down 1% from a year ago and was a 9% decline from Q1. So the business is definitely struggling. Um, and staff costs is probably the first area where Fraser is probably going to be taking a scalpel to and is taking a scalpel to. There's certainly higher staff costs as a percentage of income than the likes of JP Morgan Chase. Anyway, Q3 revenues, the forecast are coming at 19.2 billion, profits of $1.21 a share. And at the last set of numbers, Citigroup reaffirmed its full year forecast of 78 to $79 billion in revenue and expenses of 54 billion dollars. So it'd be interesting to see whether or not those numbers get tweaked. Last but not least, we've also got um, Wells Fargo. So keep an eye on that. But we've got EasyJet's numbers, fairly light on numbers when it comes to UK earnings. We've got EasyJet's uh, fourth quarter numbers, um, love them or hate them. Um, they've actually been doing fairly well over the course of the past uh, few quarters. EasyJet Holidays is continuing to generate some fairly decent profits. 
Group revenue in Q3 rose 34%, $2.36 billion. Fuel costs were higher by 40%, while costs were also higher by 7%. So the expectation for Q4 is revenues to come in 3.2 billion pounds. Did I say dollars in the last one? I think it should have been pounds. 3.2 billion pounds, while pre-tax profits are expected to surge to 691 million pounds. So all in all, the numbers look good. Shame about the uh, trust pilot scores, but hey, never mind. Anyway, that's um, that's a quick summary of what's coming up over the course of the next few days. As I say, non-farm payrolls is likely to have a big say um, as to what happens next with two equity markets, but a resilient payrolls report and a sticky inflation number could well see stock markets move lower. We want to see um, a softening of the labour market and a softening of inflation. Anyway, that's it for this week. Thanks very much for listening. It's Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets.